All right, so we are recording at the Knights of Columbus Mobile Technology Center. This is July 21st, 2021. My name is Madeline Jarvis. I'm Lara Mollers. I'm James Tian. I'm Kimberly Cowger, and it's actually July 22nd. Just kidding! <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Skip. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we're such a good team. Because <laughs> Kimberly knows the details, and I know my name. <laughs> Kimberly, how long have you been with the library? 20 years. 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and last year in August, I had been with the library for four years. What about you, Lara? Yeah, I celebrated my 20th anniversary in September of 2020. That's awesome. And James? Five days. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first week of work like here? It, um... <laughs> set a car on fire <laughs> on my first day um, and on my fifth day we had the derecho happen so <laughs> it was an entertaining first week <laughs> it's never dull around here in no. the library no not at all oh man so let's think back to the day of monday august 10th which we all know is the derecho um how did that day start for everybody well at least in mine um mondays were like my my catch-up day because we didn't do children's programming on Mondays. And since we were in the you know summer of the pandemic, there wasn't a whole lot of in-person stuff happening at the library anyway. So this day was when I came in, checked emails, went through my to-do list, and just kind of you know started checking stuff off for the week. So it was just a normal day. Like there wasn't anything special about that morning. There hadn't been any big to-dos with the kids. It was just, a regular day. A regular COVID day. Mm -hmm. My day was full of meetings. I had an admin meeting in the morning. Um, in the afternoon, I was supposed to have a meeting about the board retreat that was supposed to happen that weekend, a strategic plan meeting, and then there was supposed to be a board meeting that night. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was the night we were supposed to have a board meeting. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just lots, lots of stuff going on. And I remember I, that was the day at the admin meeting. Um, I was told to send out the invitation to all the staff and board members to save the date for the groundbreaking on October 1st. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the ground did break. <laughs> yes, it did. That's it. <laughs> and I know for me that day, so as Lara mentioned, we were still in the library, but it was, it was different from what library usually was because we are still very much, we're in COVID right now, but we were even more so in COVID. So usually the library would get around a thousand visitors every day and in the summer even more so, but due to COVID restrictions, we wanted to make sure everybody was as safe as we could make it. So we limited it to 12 patrons in at a time in the hour. So it per hour. So in the morning, um, I was the manager in the lobby, checking folks in, making sure that we didn't have folks in and out um, and then I was supposed to have lunch with a colleague uh, we just had gone through a staff transition kind of consolidating some departments eliminating some things so I went to a new role as a programming manager uh, and I wanted to pick the brains of other programming managers what works what doesn't work and he had mes messaged me around 11 at, we were planning to meet at Ramsey's which it was across the street from the library and had a beautiful outdoor seating area and said, hey, I know we talked about meeting at Ramsey's. Maybe we should do it for Zoom because my wife said it's going to rain. So we just did a Zoom meeting instead. And that's where I was when the sirens hit. Oh. Was I didn't hear the sirens because I was in a study room. I heard them from Kevin's call because he lives in Northeast Cedar Rapids. But you were home, weren't you, James? I was home, yes. Um, it was yeah, my first, we were, it was during the summer. So my kids were home and my wife was home. and. I just went home to meet him for lunch, and my dad had called me. He was he was he worked downtown Cedar Rapids, and he's like, "Hey, just gives you a heads up. There looks like there might be a storm coming. Um, Des Moines had some some higher winds. I don't know what's going to be like here." Um, I had lunch, and the, as I was getting in the car, the sirens started going off, and the kids were like, "Don't go, don't go." And I was like. It's my fifth day on the job. I'm gonna get fired if I don't make it back. So, so I, I'm driving as the sirens are starting to go off, and right when I park back in the parking lot is when the wind started picking up. Um, uh, Blaine, 
I, I parked facing towards uh, Wits End, and he's like, there's some winds coming this way. You might want to park your car this way in case any damage you know, of trees coming over. So I, I moved my car, and right when I walked in the building, the power went out. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, it was a whirlwind, and of course at the time I didn't know my way around the library. So being in the pitch black in the right. library, so I, you didn't know where the basement. No, was. I didn't know where the basement. <laughs> I was trying to find the basement, and I was going in every oh, closet. No. Every, oh, and then, oh, geez. So how did, how did you find us? Um, I, I was that. just kind of playing Marco Polo. <laughs> I was just saying like, like, yeah, hello, and then finally heard some voices, and then found my way down. <laughs> yeah, because I was supposed to work the information desk after lunch. So I went to lunch early. Mm -hmm. And while I was on my break or whatever, I was looking at Facebook and my cousin who lives in Waukee and my friend who lives in Grinnell had both posted on Facebook like, wow, that was a crazy storm. Uh, you know, people out east, you might want to, you know, you know, batten down the hatches or something like that. And I went, oh, I, my windows are down in my car. And since I worked in the public area, I walked through the staff area and was telling. Yep. I think I stopped at Kimberly's mm -hmm. and Don's desks and things like that and said, hey, if, you're, if your windows are down, you might want to go roll up your windows. It sounds like there's a storm coming. That's the only reason I even knew it was going to rain that yeah, day. I walked out, said that. I walked out in the parking lot. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was blue sky. Uh -huh. You know, it looked like August. It was hot. But, yeah, it was it, no indication at all that, you know, everything was about to go sideways, literally. <laughs> yeah. And I went out and rolled up my windows and then came back inside and sat down at my desk, you know, finished going through stuff. I literally just grabbed a notebook to head to information desk when the sirens went off. And yeah. That was okay. Everybody has to either leave the building or go to the storm shelter, you know, doing the rounds to right. clear out. I think there was like five people in the building or something like that because it was towards the end of the uh -huh. hour. You're yeah. right. It was, there were four patrons, um, a volunteer who was checking folks in and then a mama and two kids. Yeah. A family was here uh -huh. and, mm -hmm. and that was it. Like there wasn't any crowds. It wasn't like our normal busy summer where Thank God. we would have, you know, a hundred people in the children's area, but it was going and finding the few people that were at the library, letting them know about the situation and then giving them the option. Like, would you like to head out? and try to go somewhere safer at home or try to get to your next location or do you want to hunker down in the storm shelter with us? And yeah, then it was just the exodus to the downstairs, <laughs> which nobody knows where that's at. It's tucked away in the little corner of nothing. Oh. And yeah, just making our trek into the basement, which as staff, we've been down there before, yeah. but it's not like a well, place yeah. to visit. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, you had said it was going to rain, so you might want to roll up your windows. I think right after that, my husband called me and said, hey, it looks like there might be a storm. You might want to make sure you have your cell phone and stuff on you, which he often calls and tells me that because he knows that the storms aren't my thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just in case, he likes to do that. And I thought, okay, I thought the same thing. It looks fine outside. Right. I thought, I'm going to go eat my lunch now before anything happens. I walked into the lounge, literally I put my TV dinner in the microwave, and the sirens went off. And that's when we all had to go downstairs. Yeah. And at the time, it almost felt more like a hassle. Like, I was more irritated than scared yes. at that point. Because we had been through tornado warnings where nothing happened. Yep. Um, and prior to my, my Zoom meeting with Kevin, I was actually a little bit late to that because I have a pal who works for um, Uptown, and she texted me because she knows that I keep bus passes at my desk for when patrons need them. And she said, we just went to put up all the umbrellas, and there's a woman having a really tough time. Um, and I know this was right before my meeting because I was able to meet this woman who, she got, she was able to get on the 1128 bus. And I don't know what happened after that point, but like, that's something that if I had a magic ball or when I meet, when I meet St. Peter, like, I want to know that she's okay. Because all I know is she's on the bus at that point but like Kimberly said storms aren't my thing um, yeah. <laughs> where I grew up we didn't have tornadoes and when I moved to Iowa um, I knew that I didn't want to ever experience a tornado and so very consciously uh, we were trying our best to stay socially distanced in this basement this big concrete basement and I bodied up to Lara who was just kind of in performer mode I would say yeah. <laughs> Laura's just a born storyteller and was doing what she could because I was quietly freaking out, but it was pretty apparent that the kids were scared. 
So Laura and I, it was it almost felt like a vaudeville routine because yeah. we were just so heckin' happy and just chipper and chatting about Pokemon and acting like it was for the kids, but it was mostly for me. Yeah, and I I like storms. Like I'm I'm that Midwest stereotype where I want to go stand outside until I get drenched, and then I'm just gonna go inside and look from the kitchen window. And so I was like, oh, cool storm. Didn't even occur to me, you know, we've been through this drill before being mm-hmm. Midwesterners, like the sirens go off and it's probably high winds in Coggin or, right. yeah. you know, something's going through Mount Vernon. That or, was my thought when the sirens were yeah, going off. It's, it's like, not even rainy. Yeah, there's and I was like I said, I was upset here. that I did, wasn't going to get to eat my lunch because I had to go to the basement. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And you can't bring it with. It's a half frozen TV dinner. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And Marion being kind of north central part of Lynn County I mean a lot of times we'll have to go down for the sirens Mm -hmm. and nothing is anywhere near us yes and so I was just like eh Mm -hmm. bummer you know (laughs) oh well at least we'll get to go visit the super fan fun basement and yeah that that family it was a a mom and two kids and the kids weren't exceptionally young I would have said said like like 10 10 and early tween Yeah. yeah and and they were okay but obviously this was outside of their comfort zone like Mm -hmm. we were in the library we were getting books now we're in a basement it's not fun you know everybody seems a little nervous and then the power goes out yeah Mm -hmm. within like 10 minutes yeah yeah. and then suddenly you know it's everything is visible in the light of the emergency you know Mm -hmm. thing and i think that that kind of set everybody on edge because now it's not okay we're waiting through the siren right it's okay something's going on yeah. because the power's gone off yeah and i think the you know i'm i'm chatting because i'll chat to a wall <laughs> <laughs> and mom's doing okay you can tell she's she's okay with the conversation the kids are kind of chiming in and out they're they're looking at books um but for the most part they're hunkered down the thing that got their attention was that we started hearing banging and my brain immediately went, huh, you know what? Monday is recycling day at the library. Uh-huh. And we've been recycling just tons of old paperwork and stuff out of the children's area. We clean closets because in the COVID pandemic, you know, yeah. we weren't doing a lot of programming stuff. So we had a chance to clean. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, we're going to have to call public works <laughs> and let them know that like all 12 of our recycling bins are now in like Connecticut. <laughs> Like, I'm so not looking forward to that call. And, I, and the kids perk up because they can hear the banging. And it's it's pretty obvious that mm-hmm. it's a banging noise. Yeah. And I went, oh, don't worry. Monday's our recycling day. What you're hearing is the library losing every single recycling bin that we have. I bet they're going to be in City Square Park, and I'm going to have to go get them. Ugh. You know, and I make light of it. Yeah. And then I think the, where it started to get real is the wall started to leak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And at that point, honestly, Lara, I don't know if I would have made it out of the basement if I would have realized what we heard was the roof. Because in my mind, Miss Lara would never lie. <laughs> so I was like, okay, good. <clears throat> Lara is a bastion of the community. She knows what this sounds like. Um, so I was able to take a, take a deep breath. And again, at this point, I was more so on manager mode where I was ready. What if the patrons were mad that they had to be in the basement? Because, again, usually if it's a tornado siren, we hear from patrons like, why do I have to go in the basement? And I was just kind of ready for that conversation. But then when the sub pump started to go, I walked over, and I remember because we were still required to wear masks, Mm -hmm. and I was wearing a black mask with the Prince logo on it. (laughs) And in bailing, when I started to bail water, kind of squatting in a dress um I my mask fell off and so I was like oh I better stay in this corner because we were so worried about COVID yet Uh um and I just thought it was uh, this place more so than anything until uh so James and Sue another manager and I were the managers in the building and when I saw Sue get emotional I knew that something bad was happening well in the way that the basement is set up it's kind of like a T Mm-hmm. There's the stairwell, which is the emergency exit to come in and out, and then there's two branches off of that, and Madeline and myself and the family mm-hmm. were in one T, and then a few of the other 
um, staff members and the volunteer were in the other T. Mm -hmm. And then Sue and James and Blaine and was it Amy? Yeah. Yes. Were in the stairwell. And so the information that we had um, wasn't in the branch that we were in. Right. It, it was in the stairwell with James and Blaine because they came in as things were kicking off. Whereas uh, we, those of us who were in that one tee, I mean, we went down and it was still sunny. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so we, we, there was even an information disconnect within 10 feet. Yes. Because what, ha, what knowledge there was in the other part of the basement hadn't even made it to ours. So we're just kind of blissfully unaware that there's something really going on. Mm -hmm. And we're just looking at the wall going, somebody should tell Kimberly there's a leak. <laughs> right. And I actually have a video on my phone that I took of that leak because I thought, well, if this causes damage, then they're going to need to know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, tell the admin assistant so she can let somebody know that we've got a leaky basement. Yeah. Gosh, and James, you were in and out of the basement. Yes. Kind of like Laura, I am a storm. I love storms. And it was probably not the safest thing, but I kept on wanting to go upstairs just to look out the window, see what was going on. And after about my third trip up there is when it was essentially a waterfall coming yeah. from the ceiling down as ceiling tiles were popping out. And I mean, that's when it started to hit me like, okay, this is starting. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to come down, tell you no, know, but at the same time, I knew we had patrons down there. So I didn't want to say, oh wow, what's going on? I, I tried to just right. say what was going on calmly. So it just, who needed to know, needed to know. Right. And it, it was, it was real. That that's what it was real. Just um, so yeah, seeing it was a water faucet turned on in several different locations. As as we're walking around, the ceiling tiles were falling. I got one on my sh my hit me in the leg, and it's just it was, yeah. it was it was it was different. And I I would never want to experience it again. Right. Oh, that's. Do you remember that like that smell? Yes. Because that's the part where. I don't know. That's the part that I remember. It was just, it was wet. It, it yes. Just, it just smelled like wet and wet tile. Well, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and tiles don't fall until they're saturated. Yes. Yeah. And the tiles that we had in the library were not small. They were probably, what, two feet square? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so the amount of water that had to be in that tile for it to become saturated to then fall. Yeah. I mean, that is an incredible incredible volume of water coming in yes. and in not much time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, in retrospect, it felt like we were in that basement forever. Right. Yeah. But we weren't. It was maybe 40 minutes. Right. And the amount of moisture that had gotten into the building yeah. in 40 minutes was incredible. <laughs> yeah, I'd never gone upstairs, but I heard somebody say there's water coming in. And I'm thinking, like, you know, the basement wall. There's right, some water coming again. in there. I had no idea. Somehow, I did make it up the stairs, and somebody had opened the door at the top of the stairs. And that was as far as I ever made it. I never actually went out to the library. And I remember seeing the trees in City Square Park and just the wind that was happening. I was, like, literally, like, stopped in my tracks because I was, like, deer in the headlights. I can't, it's, yeah. can't train wreck. I can't look away. It was just... Uh, and that's somebody was like I think downstairs and I was like shut the door shut the door I went back down and I was whew. I never yeah I never knew what was going on upstairs yeah. until we left and and what was funny is when it was time and we got in the all clear um, there was communication coming in in spurts because mm -hmm. we had the the people on the stairs who had been up or were receiving information one person I think had news on their phone Linda was looking yeah. at stuff on Twitter right. and so there was communication there and the communication came down okay um, you know we we've been told that we can come up but and this is where it started to get real for me because the but was we're gonna have the patron and the volunteer leave first they're gonna get walked out when the staff come up, we're going to grab only what you need, and you're going to go directly out the back staff door. Do not wander. Do not stop and look at anything. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, we do not know if the building is safe. 
So our priority is to get you out of this basement, get you your stuff, and get you out. And that was when it was like, oh, like this okay. isn't, I'm gonna have to call Public Works and get the recycling bins and we gotta let Kimberly know there was a leak in the basement. Yeah. This right. was, this is not good. Yeah. Like now yeah, we, we know. We walked that, up the stairs and I'm like, there's water past the information desk and then I saw the waterfall coming in, and I was just like, oh my god, I cannot believe it. So I first went upstairs when, so I've known Sue since 2013. We were in grad school together. And so she's usually um, bright and wry and sarcastic, but she's not one to lose her cool. And when she came to me in the corner, she be lined over, and it was the third... Again, I've known her seven years, and that was the third time I saw her cry. And she said, "It's the children's collection is gone. I can't even talk about it. You, and we just kind of, we did a quick hug. And then when I went upstairs and saw, it was, it was almost like after being afraid of storms for so long, I already had the anxiety to propel me forward. And it's funny because I think about, I shouted down to let staff know that we had to head out. And the first thing I said was, great news, we're still getting paid for today. Because I didn't know it was <laughs> everywhere. I didn't know it was, wasn't was just the library. Yeah. I honestly thought that that was going to be the first people care, thing people cared about. Right. And I hadn't even seen all the damage. Yeah, because when you come up, you knew instantly we weren't going to be at work for the rest of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, we it wasn't a, oh, we're going to have to start cleaning this up. It was a we need to check if this is safe. Uh -huh. Like it wasn't even, there might be a little damage and some stuff might have gotten wet. Like this was, we are in trouble kind of yeah. damage. And that I think was the first thing that you saw when you came out of that basement was just like, oh, this, this wasn't a little storm. Yeah. And as we were clearing staff out, um, three of our staff members walked in because they were at lunch at Urban Pie, which is yeah. just like has a big glass window. <laughs> and Sandy said, I'm sorry, I have to go home. My husband texted and our camper flipped over. And Don said, I'm sorry, I, t I can tell that the roof has collapsed, but I have four trees in my living room. Uh, but still, I didn't know how bad it was. Yeah. I was like, oh, well, Don lives a few blocks away. Trees in the living room, I just... just I just assumed it wasn't that bad. Yeah. I just, I didn't have anything to compare it to. So I thought, oh no, a tree was like leaning against her roof. I don't know, I just didn't know it was bad. So well, they went and, go, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I think part of it is that we walked upstairs and our immediate thought was, oh gosh, look at the library. Yes. Yeah. And, and from there, like, our event horizon shortened. Mm -hmm. Like, you didn't really think about what's the parking lot like? What's the city square like? What's everything else like? Uh -huh. Because at that point, we didn't have any mm -hmm. information. Yeah. It was what was in front of us. Yes. Like, Dawn had received a call from her husband. Mm -hmm. Sandy had received a call from her husband. But at that point, that was all the communication that had occurred. Right. Like, the cell phones that we had didn't really work in the yeah. basement. Nobody had their computer with them. Power's out, so there's no internet. Like, at that point, we didn't know any kind of scope. Right. No. We had no and idea. Lara, we in this room have been through, like, some social services trainings, but for the purpose of this recording, talk to us about what an Event Horizon is. How would you describe that to right. somebody in elementary school? Okay, so Event Horizon is one of those terms that gets passed around a lot in, community, in continuing education, and what it is is um, your outlook for the future. If your life is in a great place, you might be planning where you're going to go to college, where you're going to go on vacation next summer, um, you know, what kind of clothes you might buy for prom. Um, that's when your, your life's in a good place. You can think about the future far ahead. When you are under stress and trauma, your event horizon shortens, meaning that all you can look at is what's right in front of you because that's mm -hmm. the biggest bite your mind can accept right now. And so somebody who is experiencing homelessness or job loss or family member loss or trauma of some type, their event horizon shortens to just dealing with the immediate issue in front of them because their mind is literally protecting them mm -hmm. from getting overwhelmed. So a lot of times people who are experiencing 
hardship, they will talk about how, you know, I can't think about how I'm going to pay for groceries next week because my car is broken down, mm -hmm. and I don't even know if I'll be able to drive to the grocery store. So their immediate focus is on the first thing that they have to fix in order to look to the future, whether that future is two hours from now, two days from now, two years from now. And so just having all of a sudden our, oh, we should start planning for the fall programs, and I gotta make sure I get some laundry done, I'm almost out of clean masks, it's, how are we gonna get out of here? Mm -hmm. Like, what, are, what, what, does, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. Because we went from having a future goal to what can I do right at this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought the same thing about, because Amy mentioned we'd have to be careful in the parking lot because of nails. And she said we need to like pick up some of the boards and stuff that are in the parking lot to be able to even get out. Mm -hmm. And I I wasn't even thinking about how whatever she was talking about got in the parking lot until I went outside and started help picking up. And I'm like, well, there's still two buildings across the street that don't have a roof anymore. Right. Right. Right, the massive brick building that was about to be moved <laughs> oh my my gosh. Gosh. It was yes. still on like giant forklift trucks, right. like several feet off the ground, and they were so concerned about making sure that it moved with structural integrity <laughs> that they jacked it up onto the truck and they left it for like two weeks because it had to sit so, right. on that truck to make sure it would be stable enough to make the, I don't know, four block hike or whatever to its current location and then you look over and it's like well it's still on the jack but a third of it's missing see i'm so glad we're having this conversation because it's been 11 months but that already slipped my mind yeah, that in preparation for the building project two antique brick houses had been planned to be moved for months and there was just literally a house parked in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. I remember joking before we went down to the basement. Somebody saying, "Oh, they they're trying to save that house, and what if it, this uh, you know storm comes in and a tornado takes it out or something?" Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. That house was missing its roof, mm -hmm. and then the Heritage Center had a lot of damage. The Roots and Bloom, which is the McGowan house, had yeah. a lot of damage, and their big pine tree was gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Scott's the house. Furniture. In between, yes, yeah. Scott's refurnishing. Place. There was no roof. Yes. So like damaged house, damaged house, no roof right in the middle. And it was almost impressive too because when I saw Scott's, it made me think about playing Legos as a kid with my brothers because it wasn't a damaged roof. It looked like a perfectly fine house. There just wasn't a roof on. Yeah, it, it uh -huh. just wasn't just finished. Just a clean break. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which was the same up the street at Wit's End. Yeah. And then when I got further, it was the same at the Granger house. So, well, James and Sue and I were tarping and bailing. Kimberly and Lara were trying to get home. And you both only live a few blocks away from yeah. where the library was. Yeah. I live eight blocks away. Leaving the parking lot, it took me 25 minutes to get to Farmer State Bank which is on the opposite side of 7th Avenue from the library. So I made it three blocks in 25 minutes with multiple detours because yes. there's trees down, there's Everywhere. no traffic signals, cars are trying Just, yeah. to figure out how to go, there are paths getting made in places that were never meant to be paths. And then you realize that everybody's rerouting because there's a power line down. Yeah. Or a chunk of roof is mm -hmm. in the middle of the street and it just took ages to even get to Farmer State Bank and I finally thought I, I've i tried every direction to get to my house and I can't so I'm going to stop here park and walk and upon getting out of the car the first thing that actually happened is that uh, a person slightly down the street said where are you trying to get to and I said I'm just trying to go four blocks that way and they went go ahead and cut through my backyard there are power lines on the street <laughs> and as an Iowa kid you know you've been told you know we're not strangers to cutting through yards but you kind of you're stealthy about it because you don't want to get caught you know, <laughs> like, hey kid get off my lawn no this person flat out told me you better walk through my yard because you're not gonna be able to use the street and going through streets, there was nothing. It was just green. Mm -hmm. And it was all the leaves and the yeah. trees that had fallen. You couldn't even see the pavement. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, um, 
it's five blocks from here to my, my house. It's four blocks from me to my mom. I'm going to stop and check on my mom first. And it's still slightly raining. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit windy, but it's not bad. But the thing that I remember is that it was almost silent mm -hmm. because yes. you don't realize how much noise is made by electricity mm -hmm. and there was none. So you could hear cars occasionally, but they weren't going fast. Nobody was going no. fast. Okay. So it was just maybe a little engine noise, but it wasn't the sound of moving traffic. Mm -hmm. There was no ambient electrical noises at all. People were outside trying to yell up to each other and maybe trying to use a cell phone. But it was, it was just almost eerily quiet. Um, especially considering that everything was just chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. I mean, I live really close. I mean, literally, with traffic, it might take two minutes for me to get from my house to the library. And it probably took, I don't know, between 30 and 45 minutes for me to get home. Because just every way you went, there was just, there was trees, there was power lines, there was... I went down 8th Avenue and I saw our board member, Kara, in the street with an axe <laughs> on a tree that had fallen from a, a friend of mine's yard. And it was just, like, surreal. I'm like, oh, my God, God bless you, Kara. And I was just trying to get home, just trying to get home. And I was like, it's right over there. I almost did what you did and stopped and walked. But eventually I saw, like, a little bit of space. And I thought, I could probably plow through there. My car will get scratched, but at least I could get home. And I did make it. But you're right. It was just, like, there was just traffic everywhere because everywhere were, like, does anybody know how I can get down Central Avenue? I'm just I'm trying to get home. And it was just crazy. Yeah. And I just, like, when you're talking about the cell, I mean, it just totally brought back. When, we, when I was in the, um, down the stairwell, I texted Henry, who was a 12-year-old kid that has a cell phone in front of him at all times. I just Your said, son. Yeah, my son. Yeah, I was like, are you all right? I didn't hear back from them until, like, three hours later. Yeah. So... So we were, and I was like, I had no idea what happened back home. And so that was until like, then I think it was about three hours later, mm -hmm. I, I got a text back, like, that was a bad storm. So it was like three <laughs> hours of just not knowing the yeah. unknown of not even a message from wife or kids. And so that, I totally forgot like how bad that cell phone reception was yeah. back then. So, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, yeah, I remember trying yeah. to call my husband to tell him what way I had found to get to our house. Because mm -hmm. I was going to tell him, don't go this way, that we usually come home. And I remember, like, screaming into my cell phone because he couldn't hear me because the reception was right. just so bad. And I still was Pollyanna about this and thought, at least I can go home. I felt so bad for you Marion folk because I live in Southeast Cedar Rapids. And I was like, well, I'm going to have power at home. And I texted my husband and was like, <clears throat> have a cold beer waiting for me. He oh. will not believe my day and I still like it wasn't until I was in my car for 45 minutes on my four and a half hour drive home seven miles that I realized oh shit and I live in a, host, a historic neighborhood called Oak Hill Jackson because it's one of the oldest neighborhoods in Cedar Rapids <laughs> and it's named so because when it was settled by white people in the 1800s they were struck by how many old established oaks there were yep and yeah, but anyway, so James and I are tarping with Sue, and when I say tarping, I mean every plastic bag we can find, just scuttling around um, some gallows humor. So the leaks were really bad over the teen fiction, some of the children's fiction, and then the adult nonfiction. And as we're running away, and I described it for my team after the fact, is we were supermarket sweeping. Yeah. <laughs> you know, grab anything of value, put it over here. Tarp everything else of value. Um, but we didn't tarp some of the travel books because it was COVID. And Sue and I turned to each other and we're like, well, nobody's going to need to plan a Disneyland <laughs> event because it's a pandemic. And so it felt really good to be able to. This was probably an hour and a half into our cleanup. Um, it felt really good to laugh for that minute. <laughs> But meanwhile, here's James in a suit and a fluorescent vest. <laughs> because our old director had given me two fluorescent 
vest as a joke because I <laughs> love safety procedures and policies. And so I like threw one to James. I was wearing one for a while until Tom Treharn, who is the community development director for the city, came by and then I was able to toss that one to him. And it is amazing how it was like the sky was gray because with the dust of everything from the yes. library settling in this dark, how what a blessing those vests were. Yes. Uh, so meanwhile, James, as Sue and I are running around tarping art collection, my first thought was to run and protect the seed library. Uh, but you had to take a look at all the technology, and you were new, and you're the new technology, yeah. not even just the new technology manager, but we didn't have a technology manager yeah. before. Yes, yeah, so I was on my hands and knees, I'm plugging everything oh. and trying to get, like, afraid when the power comes back on, it's going to fry. fry everything. So I was crawling around in water and... And, um, everything's but yeah got everything unplugged got it up on higher ground and and of course me being a music head and I was I'm gonna go cover those CDs but <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but those aren't there anymore so <laughs> well and it, it, it's interesting because you know with library world we know that books and water do not get along mm -hmm. so having that much moisture in a library building everybody's like oh my gosh there's right. it, things are gonna get moldy or we're gonna have water damage. It, it was such a bizarre thought to think because there is water literally streaming in through the roof. There is standing water on the ground. There is no electricity. We're not gonna get HVAC anytime soon, <laughs> let alone is it gonna help because there are probably gaping holes in the roof. Like, so much of what was happening in the library was band-aids on broken legs. Yes. Because it was, we can't fix this. How do we keep it from going even more sideways? And it was, I, it, the, we ended up, some of the staff that were in the basement were told to leave. And that was mainly the people that weren't on leadership team. So it was up to like, six or seven people who stayed behind to secure 20,000 square feet of space that has catastrophic damage in a way that, you know, it was like triage right. in a hospital. Like, who needs immediate care right now? What can hold off? But the whole building needed it. Yep. And it was just... Uh, it was such a daunting task. <laughs> and after we had, the way we transport books between locations are in these big gray bins. And so we had, I had these route bins throughout to kind of catch leaks. And at that point, James went outside and took pictures because we were just kind of catching leaks as we heard them. And it's amazing how quickly you can pivot and I feel like to this day, I could listen to ceiling tiles and know when they're gonna fall. <laughs> but James came back with his camera and I didn't recognize because again, it was almost like Legos. There wasn't a big gaping hole in the roof. It was just, here are the pieces that are gone. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, 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 this isn't a shadow. This is where we are right now. Yeah, that's above us <laughs> or and, yeah. technically not above us. <laughs> And James, I'm new to Iowa, but you grew up in Marion. So, what was it like for you? Because you were the one to kind of stick your neck out. Yeah, it was it, it was heartbreaking. I mean, I yeah, I, I love Marion, and I mean, I grew up in the park across from the library, and just seeing the damage and Zoe's. I mean, you can see the back of Zoe's, and, and it was it was it kind of had flashbacks of oh, you know, like okay I remember what this is what it looked like and this was what it was yeah. now so it was it was a mental overload of what yeah. was going on but um and then especially on the, the drive home it, it was normally a I live north of Marion and it took me two and a half hours mm -hmm. and and then just like the Granger house yeah. Yeah. like everything right there it was just it was it was, a, it was a kind of like a pit sick feeling but yeah I guess it's kind of like you said like triage mode you, you do what you got to do so it's just kind of flipped a switch and then went to work. Yeah. And when you say North of Marion, you mean you lived maybe four miles from the library tops and usually when you drive home, you just get on 10th Street and you do like two other turns. Yes, yeah, yeah and yeah, my, my normal drive here is eight minutes. Yeah. yeah. And it was a two and a half hour, so it was. Yeah, and I, I live in the Pucker Street 
historic district. Mm -hmm. And part of what that street is known for is all those historic houses with all those old trees. And I remember, because I I couldn't go down 8th Avenue. It was completely barricaded off. So I kind of went in through everybody's streets and, and backyards and stuff like that. So I couldn't see Pucker Street. And it wasn't until probably a day or two later that I finally was able to kind of look down Pucker Street and realize that it was never gonna look Mm -hmm. like Pucker Street again. Between the damages to the houses and how many trees were gone was just devastating. And, And I don't even think I even realized it then how bad it was gonna be because the trees were still there. Right. They just weren't vertical. Yeah. And so it's like your brain saw all the greenery, but it wasn't where it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So it went, oh, that's not right. But I don't think it really let me see yeah. exactly how wrong it was. I met your dad the next day. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once again, in the mentality, I didn't want to get fired. I, I, I wanted to make sure I was at work. Like, I better bring two Jameses. Yeah. Get yes. the work done. My dad's here. He's, he'll vouch for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the next day I was, uh, um, yeah, I was at work at 8 o'clock and ready, ready, right. ready to go. And then, yeah, my, my dad was, we, we were living with my parents at the time. And so he, he knew that I was up and he's a, he, he can't sit still. So he wanted to go along and do whatever he could. So he was. Your retired police officer yep, dad. Yeah, yep, retired police officer dad wanted to get in and help as much as he could with the city. So he was in there boxing up books so we could, because. Mm-hmm. We were going to try to box up books and to at least get him out of the way. So he was, he was right there in the thick of things. And, mm-hmm. and I remember too, there was damage at because you guys were building a new house, mm-hmm. and there was damage where you were staying. So you guys had to try to find a hotel with a dog. Yes, which was hard. Yeah, that, that was the, that first night. Um, we, we we got to my got to my parents' house where we were staying, and we were just calling everywhere, all the hotels. We were calling like Animosa, mm-hmm. like, and then. We uh, Riverside, which is an hour away, we were able to. Um, my parents have a, a lot of vouchers for hotel rooms, so <laughs> so nice. so we were able to get rooms for both my parents as well as myself and the dog for for a, we had like five days down there. So we were mm-hmm. in the meantime we were I was going back and forth each day, but it was had the power where I was I I, I was still in the mentality that. I needed to have a computer, internet access to do what I would need to do for work, and right. being new, I didn't know what the, the responsibility was. So, but yeah. But I feel like it doesn't matter if you work there for five days or fifty years. Like, not, we were all kind of reassigned and recalibrating every hour. Yes. Well, I think it was. It was like two or three days later. Um, Finally, we were able to get some form of communication out, um, and it was, we're going to meet in the supplementary parking lot next to the library in the morning, um, you know, ready to come. And we got there, and, and everybody has the same kind of shell-shocked look on their face. Like, the library staff are normally effervescent, vibrant, outgoing extroverts, and every single person is just standing there with like this absent look on their face because everybody's in their own heads. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of given marching orders, you know, like some people are going to go man information stations at high traffic areas, Walmart, Hy-Vee, things like that. Some people are going to stay here at the library and help inside start the process of everything Mm -hmm. that has to happen there. Some people are going to get um, farmed out to other city districts that need help. So a couple people went on to direct traffic. Some people went to work with the building inspectors. Um, Some people were arranging, you know, information, communication between areas and stuff like that. And when it was kind of like, okay, break, that was the last time that staff met as a group on library property. Like that was the last time we as a staff had a meeting at the library. After that, it was we met in the parking lot of the police station, or you took shifts at the temporary tech station at Thomas Park, or you know, it was the daily email from your manager on the leadership team letting you know what tomorrow's schedule was gonna be. So that was the last time 
until probably October, November, when I think we had a staff meeting. At Columbus Club. Yeah, that was the last time that every member of staff were present together on library person. Yeah. And it was just, it wasn't us because we weren't who we were. We were somebody who was struggling to get through that day because we couldn't imagine what the next day was gonna be. And so it was kind of interesting because we, we were all grouped together to talk <laughs> six feet apart. In masks. <laughs> In masks. <clears throat> and it was like we felt together and so alone because nobody knew how everybody was doing because you, we couldn't take that time yet. Mm -hmm. Like there wasn't a chance to even sit down and say, how are you doing? Because there was so much to do that nobody even had a chance to think on that yet. And it was, it was weird because it was kind of like uh, analogy of a phoenix. You know, they burst into flame, turn to ash, and then have to rebuild. And that was the, we've just ascended into ash moment. Like, we have nothing. Now it's time to start rebuilding. But we hadn't gotten to the, you know, glorious moment of, yay, we can do this. We were at the, oh God, this is, this is it moment. And I think that was rough because as yeah. a team, we were used to going right. through anything. And I think that was probably the lowest moment as a team that any of us had ever had before. Right, because to be able to comfort your team, there were so many emotions going on when it was that the Thursday after the storm where I think all staff were brought together. And at that point, we're told the damage was to the point where this will never be the library again. And I started hugging people. And I remember I wasn't even nervous about the library. At that point, I was like, I hope I don't get in trouble for hugging somebody because I'm breaking COVID policy. Yeah. And I feel like we would have been able to handle that situation with so much more dignity and grace had we been able to go home and be people. But since yeah. we were all going home to a hot, broken house with no cold showers, like you can't even start with that yeah. process. There, there wasn't a break between personal anguish and professional anguish. Yes. No. Like yeah. you didn't have a chance to clock out and go home and pet your cat and have an ice cream or a cold beer. Like you went home and went, I've got to do everything I can do before the sun sets because as soon as the sun sets, I won't be able to see anything. Mm -hmm. And so you just didn't even have a moment to clock off. Right. And we were, we were definitely feeling that strain. I will say, you, you said this like, yeah, I, this is like the lowest time of everybody. I cannot imagine having a better team than we had. Oh, I mean, right. you, yes. you, everyone in that meeting, I, I have never been so proud to be part of a team. I, I, I was I was the new new guy, but knowing that I was part of this strong team and what you were doing that time, I it was an honor to be around each one and every one of you. You 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 took it with grace. You mm -hmm. you, you didn't skip a beat. You I the city of Marion and surrounding they they were lucky to have your your team part of me. I wouldn't have asked for anybody else to do what you did during that time. Can I tell you about the best gift I've ever gotten? Yes. About 11 days after the storm, I still didn't have power. And our former coworker, Becky, cornered me and said, you're coming over tonight to do laundry. And I said, oh, you don't have to do this. You know, there's a lot on everybody's plate. I didn't want to add to her stress. And she said, I'm not taking no for an answer. So I showed up with my laundry and I just brought in one basket and she looked at me because she got power back after three days. She was like, there's no way that's all your laundry. Go get the rest. And she gave me, I felt like a person again. And that's a gift I can never forget. Or the Wednesday after, our coworker Chanel lives about a mile from me. And for some reason, the person who used to own her house had installed generators. And at the time, it was just one of those weird quirks, like those kitchen cabinets. You don't know why they're pink. But she let me come over and charge my phone. And again, it just takes those little steps of saying, you have the dignity and grace of a person, even though you feel like everything around you is broken. And it took them nothing, but that's kindness I will never forget. Speaking of Becky, 
that same, it was the first weekend after the derecho, and, and she had said, like, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm getting a little worried because I'm starting to run out of clothes that are decent for work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, well, you're going to come to my house and do some laundry. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to bring enough to, like, you know, not get in trouble with dress code because, you know, that's going to happen. <laughs> <during> <laughs> and... And so I went over there and, and got a load of laundry started, and I came downstairs, and her husband had made lunch. And it was just a cold lunch meat sandwich with chips and apples. And I remember just, like, diving into it. And afterwards, I felt kind of bad because I was like, well, that was probably the most ungraceful meal I've ever done because I just hounded into that sandwich. <laughs> And it was just because it felt so good to have something that I didn't have to work for in that moment. Right. And then <laughs> afterwards, I ended up taking a nap on her living room floor because they had air conditioning. Uh-huh. And it just, it was like the first time I'd slept. Right. And afterwards, I, the um, you know, laundry was done and everything, and I was like, I can't thank you enough for all this. And as I'm heading out the door, she had, while I was sleeping, crowdsourced her neighbors to find a cooler some ice, bread, and lunch meat so I could go home and have a sandwich for dinner. Oh, oh my god! And I, I just remember sitting there going, I can't even imagine how thoughtful that was because I had literally just had lunch, laundry, and a nap, and it felt like heaven. And then on my way out the door, she gives me a cooler with something that I don't have to think about for the rest of the day. Especially because your fridge was duct taped. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was shut because I wasn't opening that for nothing. (laughs) And it was just one of those blissful moments where I called my mom and I went, I have lunch meat and bread and balls of water. Are you ready for lunch? I'm bringing lunch. You know, like it was just that moment of surreal, like I can't believe this is where I'm at. And it felt fabulous, even though it had just been absolute, you know, horribleness up until that moment. It was, I think during this time, we'd started seeing like those glimpses of pure joy. Mm -hmm. And they weren't big things, like somebody with a cold bottle of water you know, somebody letting you come over and use their laundry. Um, somebody who, you know, had an extra bag of ice that they couldn't use before it melted. Do you want some? And it was just these little moments of joy mm-hmm. that we would never have considered really prior to this. But since we were in such a low point, these little, you know, common decencies were just glorious. And it meant so much. And it's like, it's bread and lunch meat. No, it wasn't. It was a hug when nobody could hug. Yeah. Oh, man. So you mentioned that we were kind of, we were helping where we could because we weren't doing story times. We weren't checking out books. But we were doing what librarians do, which is connect people to the resources that they need. Um, So on that Friday, I directed traffic, which was... I didn't know that I would be good at that, but I love directing traffic um, out by Public Works. And there was an eight-hour shift, and I got my first mask tan line. But catch this. It was eight hours, and I got handed from people stopping six bottles of water and a Snickers bar. And it was just people driving past, seeing a community helper. And two of the bottles of water were even cold. Um, So we were doing our best to stay hydrated, but people were just doing whatever they could to be helpful and it was almost like it almost had the feel of like seeing your teacher in the grocery store as a kid because you're seeing all these community leaders in clothes that you can empty out a fridge and mow lawns in Um, and you mentioned what can I wear to work Uh, it was that Thursday James and I were at the police station because that was temporary command because they had enough generators to power things and we were getting some of the library's iPads up to code and I was wearing yoga pants and a band t-shirt that I had cut the sleeves off of and here comes Tom Trehart in a fucking suit. <laughs> like, not a swimsuit, but like a, I work at City Hall oh and I'm wearing a suit. And he looked like he, like he was just a man in a suit and air conditioning and I just kind of like looked up and I was like, I shouldn't be in the same room as you. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so funny because again, James was new, I'm still getting to know him. Um, 
there were four mini iPads and five big iPads. And before he started, like the IT work had been shared to a few different areas. All this to say was the iPads were on me and I had named the four after the Beatles and the five after the Spice Girls. <laughs> and so the good news is me and James and Terrell, who's the city's IT manager, got to talk about like some concerts we had seen and some bands we had gone to. Uh, but I just felt so like criminally underdressed in my yoga pants, but I just didn't know what work was going to look like. So I just covered up what I had to and got my guitar. Yep. yep. It was, am I covered? Am I cool? That was the requirements for dress code in derecho world. And the answer was yes, and God, I wish. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. So I asked for an hour of your time, and is it okay if I ask one more question since we're about that hour? Mm -hmm. How has the past 11 months helped you grow? I think for me, it, even just professionally, um, as a programmer, part of what we do at the library is we're a face. We're the face that when people talk about the library, they talk about who they saw when they went to the library, who sang to their kids at story time, who shared a laugh and a smile when the computers were being weird. Um, and so in turn, we're kind of used to, when we go out into the community, like, oh, you're a library person. And, and it's, it's just a recognition thing. And now it's a little bit reversed. Um, because since we don't have a, a permanent structure and we are dealing with unprecedented times, we're not used to seeing our library people anymore. Mm -hmm. And so now when we're at the technology station or when we travel to the uptown library branch or if we're going out and doing an outreach at a park it's oh my gosh it's my person from the library how are you how are you doing and it it's almost given us a chance to realize how much the community meant to us mm -hmm. because we for years have been oh my kid loved coming to story time and I, I'm so thankful you were here. I couldn't have gotten this application finished without you. And it, it was all the community members telling us that they couldn't do without the library. And I think it made me realize that the library couldn't do without them. Mm -hmm. Because now it's whenever I see them, I get emotional. I find myself saying, it's okay. I don't have to be at that next minute. I'm talking to so-and-so. And it's making those connections again. Mm -hmm. Because after 11 months without them, 11 minutes feels like paradise mm -hmm. and I think that's probably the thing that has gotten me now is just like I'm so happy to see our people again whether it's the person who always has trouble with the printer <laughs> or you know the the person who isn't sure that they're supposed to come to the story time because their kids are not old enough or too old or it's a daycare or it's just a single mom it's, it's realizing that they were what made us important. And so now that they're coming back, it's feeling like we have a purpose again. Two weeks ago, uh, Laura and I were working out here together at the tech station and I had to come back into this room and cry for a little bit because one of our regulars had come in with her grandma and she wasn't even one of my program kids. She was just always there after school with her baby doll and I just lost it because again, we just, we just want to know people are okay. And when she walked in and you know, and especially since we work with kids and teens, so our people are growing up and teenagers are getting so tall. And I, yes. saw, I saw two of, I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but um, City Hall is across from Vernon Middle School and I saw two of my, two of my favorites. Um, leaving Vernon and I was so excited I parked I'd like <laughs> parked my car in the middle of the parking lot and without even thinking about how creepy I look shouted out to these two boys and was like do you remember me and they were like oh hey you're from the library and I was like I love you <laughs> I love you um and they're coming back to library programs when we're in our new space they're both taller and stinkier and sweeter than ever um, but that's the other thing is I'm trying to be better at showing my vulnerability and my appreciation because 
I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but since this happened to us, there's nobody I would rather have it be with. Just, I love this team. I've done a lot of Kermit flailing <laughs> over <laughs> random people on the streets, and they probably just like, well, the library people have gone crazy. Yeah. I say for me, that what's changed in the last 11 months is appreciating the little things anymore. Um, to be honest, that three hours when I didn't hear from Jack and the kids, it, it, it made me realize how much I take things for granted. So I think that was a wake-up call for me, and knowing, appreciating the little things no matter what it is, mm -hmm. if it's saying hi to someone, like just something you just take for granted, don't take things for granted. It, it, it could just take a storm to change things for everyone, which it did, and it just, it was eye-opening for me, mm -hmm. and it made me really put my priorities in perspective. So yeah. I think we're, this, it, was, it was a great, I don't want to say it was a great 11 months for me, but it was, personally, it was good knowing what I need to do, so. Yeah, I know what you mean about, like, taking things for granted, because that library building had a lot wrong with it. We complained about it all the time. Yeah. We were so excited that we were going to be getting a new building, but to have it taken away mm. so quickly. With no goodbye. Yes. And it was just, I know it's just a building, but it's kind of like you said, it's, it's really, it's our team and mm -hmm. our team isn't together anymore. And so that's really hard. But I know what you mean too about like getting excited right before I came here. I was at lunch at Culver's. I saw two of our volunteers <laughs> oh. and I was just like so excited that they both were asking about coming back when we have the new building. And it's just like, you know, they, they want to come help us, but we, we have to have a building for them to come have something to do for they can help us. Uh, I think that's the question of the, the 11 months is, when are you coming back? Mm -hmm. And it's been a hard question because we didn't know. You know, like, we have to get the groundbreaking ceremony done. We have to get the building built. We have to get in all of our stuff in there. We have to bring our staff <laughs> back together. But I think the, the takeaway from all that question is they're not only ready, but we're ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, we are ready to be the library again. And I think people are ready for us to be the library again. Because I think that was one of the things that people realized is that the library was a space. It was their space. And they made that space. And I drive by that building all the time now, and I go, oh, the old library. It's not the building I miss. Although I do miss the building. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I miss everything that it, it had, the, the people, the programs, the emotions that went into it. And I think part of it is, is still like, it will always be a loss, but I'm hoping that, like James said, starting to appreciate the things you didn't realize you didn't have, I think everybody's ready to get what they had back. Yeah, the grief isn't getting smaller, I think our, we're getting bigger. Yeah. We're rising from the ashes, like yes. you said. With yeah. <laughs> We're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Are we reaching higher? Yes. Oh. Oh. Cut. <laughs> Somebody tell Mayor Nick. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everybody.